And uh, I just want to start by saying welcome everyone um, to the third of the virtual dialogue series of Engage the Elections, um, a virtual dialogue series entitled uh, The Power of Community Colleges in Voter Turnout. Um, this is part of a project of, um, of Campus Compact um, through its newly acquired the Democracy Commitment Initiative um, to engage, to really, really leverage the, um, the 2018 elections um, and really to bring out the power of community colleges. I will um, explain a little bit more about the project in a second, but I'm just uh, glad that you are all here um, with us. This is a really weird time, not just in the semester because it is, it's like midterm, almost approaching midterms. Also, it's a weird time of the day. One o'clock is, is uh, particularly for community colleges, is prime time. <laughs> so a lot of people are in classes right now unable to be on the call. But, you know, do not fret because these, um, all of these, uh, uh, these dialogues are being recorded um, and uh, will be available on the Engage the Election Project page, uh, which will be released shortly. Um, as soon as we're done editing the videos, um, the page will be released and it will have a lot of resources. It will have um, who's in the project and we'll be updating it as we uh, go along. But um, today, what we're going to be doing is, you know, I just did the welcome and we're going to overview what the project is. Um, and then I'm going to be uh, talking about some of my experiences at Monroe Community College. Oh, by the way, my name is Virtus Robinson. <laughs> I forgot to, uh, you forgot to um, introduce myself there. And I am the Director of Community College Engagement for Campus Compact. Um, and formerly the National Director of the Democracy Commitment of which Campus, now the, is housed and lives at Campus Compact. Um, and before then, I was um, a tenured assistant professor of history and African American studies at Monroe Community College. And so I'll be sharing some of my experiences there, um, followed by uh, David Bodery um, from St. Clair Community College in Ohio. And then after um, David Bodery speaks about um, their efforts to engage the election, um, I mean, we're really, really focused on the unique challenges and, and also the unique opportunities of community college and what I call civic power of community colleges. Um, and we'll be hearing from what's going on in Brooklyn um, from, uh, uh, from Helen Margaret Nasser from um, CUNY Kingsborough Community College. And, at, and when I was talking about this before, I was like New York City. I was like, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna get me for saying New York City, it's, it's Brooklyn. <laughs> and I've been there a couple of times, beautiful campus. If you haven't um, been there, just go to visit, and you'll love it. It's, 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 it's on the water, it's, it, it's, it's just absolutely gorgeous campus. And very, very diverse, one of the diverse community college campuses I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so they have a lot of unique challenges and opportunities that we'll hear from when um, as they are engaged in the election there. And then, um, you know, there, there should be time afterwards uh, for a little dialogue. Um, and uh, maybe I'll ask a, a couple of questions. Um, and again, this is meant not to be a webinar per se where you just sit and listen, but a way uh, for us to talk about what's going on, even on your campuses, the people who are on the line. Um, because what's gonna happen with these three um, webinars is that I'm going to fuse it into a, um, a, uh, a blog about um, engaging the election and the, the civic power of community colleges in voter registration, voter education, and voter turnout. Um, so today is gonna to be focused on voter turnout, but just to let you know a little bit about the project itself, um, it is a direct response by Campus Compact through its newly acquired the Democracy Commitment Initiative um, to leverage the midterm elections in 2018 this year, creating electoral engagement opportunities for community college students, many of whom are first generation, low income, and students of color. In fact, um, I was just reading an article today that, that they are predicting that um, since the registration rates are through the roof, um, for college students that they believe that the turnout will be um, the, the biggest turnout that they've seen in 50 years. 
but that doesn't mean that we do not stop the efforts to get the students and communities to the polls just because of that prediction. That's a good way to be like, okay, our job here is done, let's stop. No, we have to continue um, the effort and push right towards election and not even stop there. The day after, let's debrief and let's move to the 2019. Um, again, it's a nonpartisan effort, um, but to get what um, the president of Campus Compact said yesterday in a meeting, full participation. Let's try to get that full participation um, for the sake of our democracy. Um, so the project is intended to yield ideas, insights, pr um, principles, and practices that will reflect the unique challenges and unique opportunities for community college campuses in the context of their special ties to the communities. And additionally, we intend for this project to yield resources that will be useful for a broader network of community colleges. And also understanding that unique um, pathway between two-year and four-year. Just because we, we're focusing on the two-year doesn't mean that it stops there, it continues um, uh, when they transfer, or if um, their two-year um, two degree is their terminal degree. It will continue on um, beyond the, um, the graduation of two, of, um, from the community colleges. Um, to help us out, we received about $27,000 grant from the Young Invincibles and its Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, of which I serve on the advisory board for. And we have, um, in fact, um, awarded 14 community college campuses, about um, the total about $1,850 apiece. Um, and they all are, or supposed to be, active members of Campus Compact. Um, and they really brought, is really broad ranging. So let me just give you an example. So we have Allegheny College of Maryland, um, which is in the mountains of Maryland. Yes, Maryland has mountains, believe it or not. I've been up there. My cell phone service doesn't work up there. <laughs> um, but Allegheny College of Maryland. Um, College of the Canyons, which is in um, uh, California, Southern California. Delta College, which is in Michigan. Um, Johnson County Community College, which is in Kansas, Kingsboro Community College, which is in Brooklyn, um, Kirk, um, Kirkwood Community College, which is in Iowa, uh, Lane Community College in Oregon, um, Mesa Community College in Arizona, Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, which is Western New York, um, Piedmont Virginia Community College, Raritan Valley um, Community College in New Jersey, Santa Fe College, in not New Mexico, but Florida. <laughs> um, Tarrant County College, um, Southeast Campus, which is outside of Dallas, Fort Worth area in Texas. And last but not least, Wilbur Wright College, one of the city colleges of, of, of Chicago in Illinois. So as you can see, they spread out across the country and, um, and they were given this, um, this award. Um, but this grant, and it's really to support the work of um, electoral engagement on their campuses. Normal times, especially with community colleges, this work is being done un unfunded without any um, uh, support, um, but it happens nevertheless. So with this, uh, with this grant um, and with these participants, what we're going to do is we're going to use each one of these colleges as a case study because they're very, very different in composition and student uh, makeup, as well as locations and their, um, and their ties to the community to, um, to come up with a resource as to how do we electorally engage community college students and utilizing their unique ties to the community. Um, so, this is a part of the grant, these, um, this series of dialogues. And we've had uh, two others, and this is the last one, but the two others that we've had before were um, about a couple of weeks ago, where we engaged lead MN um, in Minnesota, Piedmont Virginia Community College, as well as College of the Canyons on their voter registration. Just to give you an example, lead MN, which is a, um, uh, or a nonprofit organization that works with um, the student services or student um, clubs and government um, for all of the community colleges in Minnesota has registered over 3,000 students um, in a few weeks. 
So they, um, and so they were talking about um, that, um, uh, that effort and the way that they were able to do that. Um, last week, we talked about voter education. So after you register p students to vote, it doesn't stop there. How do we um, create not just active um, voters, but informed voters? So what ways on community college do we educate voters about what's on the ballot, what's at stake in a nonpartisan way? So we had De Anza College, Santa Fe College, it was Cuyahoga, um, Cuyahoga, excuse me, I was corrected last week, <laughs> Cuyahoga Community College. Um, and demystifying voting, um, as well as bringing on um, elected officials um, on campus and different ways to do that, as well as the resources of Campus Vote Project. And if you haven't been to Campus Vote Project's website, just campusvoteproject.org, they have tons of resources, including toolkits and handbooks and things like that, which we would like to emulate, but make it specific for community college campuses. So um, those videos will be available on the website as well as this one. Um, the way that you can stay in touch is there's my email address right there. Just feel free to email me uh, with questions and things like that, comments, even um, to let us know what you're doing. We would love for you to be a part of our resources, not just the 14 campuses that I mentioned, but what's going on in your campus as well. Um, but the grant is too late. But nevertheless, um, we would like to see what is going on and hear what is going on in your campuses. So if you'd like to be a part of this project, by all means, um, uh, let me know and stay in touch. But without further ado, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen so you can see my face and whatnot, um, if you can. Um, and, and, um, and just talk to you just a little bit about my experiences at Monroe Community College campus when I was a professor there and how it really changed my life um, when he talks about when we talk about voter turnout because yeah we had the voter registration drives drives um, you know we 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 had some poster sessions about what's on the ballot and things like that but really pushing um, uh, to um, students to the polls. One thing that we did, um, one thing I did in my class was um, I, I turned it into a service learning project. And I took one of my, uh, my um, African American history classes and we talked about, we educated ourselves about the, um, the history of voting rights and, um, and how at certain points of, of our history, only white males who had property were able to vote. Um, now, um, you have to be 18 and a citizen. That's huge. <laughs> That's a huge, huge um, uh, tr uh, development. And it took a lot of um, laws. It took a lot of marching. It took a lot of protests to get that happen, to get that to happen. Um, so to educate students one is one thing, to, to tell them about the history and the development. But then to get them to the polls is another. So one thing that we did is the, right the day before elections, and there's various ways that I'm going to hear from David as well as Helen about the different ways that they've done it. But one, things, one thing that I did was um, the day before election, we had our own version of Rock the Vote. Now, we didn't have any money, so we couldn't get bands, you know. Um, I, I'm going to name, I was going to name a, a star, but, you know. Uh, but the stars I was going to name are dead now, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm not going to go there. But we couldn't get anyone that would that would draw a whole bunch of people to our campus. So we just Taylor used our, Swift wasn't it, available. No, Taylor Swift was not available, David. Unfortunately, not. And you know, I was I was going to name Prince, but I was like, wait a minute, he just right. passed away. Right. Um, you know, but again, I'm talking about you know ten years ago. So yeah, he could have come, but you know, we didn't have enough money for him. Um, but, you know, and also we couldn't get, you know, because that was about 10 years ago, um, we couldn't get Barack Obama to come show up. We couldn't get McCain to show up. Shea Palin did come to our, uh, to our city, but she went to a, um, a bookstore. So we couldn't get her on campus. Um, so what we did was we said, okay, we're going to utilize what we have. We have an iPod. <laughs> So we have music, <laughs> the, uh, and we can hook it up to a speaker, great. So we had dance music. Um, we had a, a whole setup of posters that my students created about 
the local elections about who was going up for county executive and who's going up for city council, who was going up for uh, the school board, uh, people that directly affect um, our community college and our community college students and the community around us. Um, not just the presidents, not just the, the, uh, this, the, um, the, the state senators, but our local senators and things like that. And, and then the people that we made posters about and what they stood for and what they were campaigning for, we invited them and about 15 of them came. Um, they came for an hour. Um, we had music going. We had about 80 students show up because they saw all these candidates coming. Our students were by their posters explaining who was, who, um, who was uh, about their research. And then the candidates start coming and going to their posters that my students created about them, taking pictures with them and talking to them. Um, and, in the, and then we told them, okay, we want you to speak. But we don't want you to say why we should vote for you, but why we should vote in general. We gave them a few minutes, they got up there and they spoke and in between, we did a group dance number like the Macarena, no one knows about that. The electric slide, the Cupid shuffle. It was so funny because some of them could dance, majority of them couldn't, but it was okay because they let their hair down, they were relaxed, they weren't on their podiums, they weren't on their soap boxes. And, um, and they got a chance to really interact with our students. The day before elections, that was the, the I mean, they were able to relax and to, and to meet the people who are gonna be voting or not voting for them um, in a very casual, very, very uplifting and powerful way. And it was my students that were the ones that were um, emceeing. I was sitting, standing in the background, taking pictures and dancing a little bit too. They got me out there too. <laughs> and, um, and the very next day, um, let me tell you, my students were out there. They, were, they, 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 I mean, they were so inspired that they actually got a chance to see who they were voting for. And it wasn't about you know, Barack Obama, it wasn't about, even though that was a very important election, they were also uh, voting for the, their, their county supervisor, the state um, senator who had direct ties to that budget that was going to influence their tuition, what resources that our college was going to have and everything. Um, and, you know, and believe it or not, this was 10 years ago, I voted for the very first time. And so did my students. Um, one of my students was 56 years old and was voting for the very first time and he wrote about it um, and it was published in the, in the local newspaper. So we don't even know how many people he had influenced uh, when he told, talked about his story. Um, that, very, that evening, about 11 o'clock p.m., um, I, um, I can remember it right now, I'm getting kind of teary-eyed right now, but you know, I was preparing a lecture, um, two lectures, uh, for my African American history classes, they were they were really really brutal. One was about um, sexual exploitation during um, slavery, and then the other one was about um, how in 1892 about over 2,000 people were lynched and no one was ever brought to justice. And when they had announced that Barack Obama had become um, the first African American elect um, presidential. Uh, um, pre um, you know, elect, I, I mean, I, tears just start flowing from my eyes. And it wasn't because, you know, I thought, I mean, I had witnessed something that I thought I would never see in my lifetime. It was because I participated. So I just, you know, did away with my lecture. We came in the next morning and my whole class, we had American flags. We, 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 were, we were dancing around, including the people that voted for McCain <laughs> and voted for the Green Party. They were just like, whatever, but they were smiling too. It wasn't because, you know, we won this very big victory, it's because we had participated. And so we reflected on that, we wrote about that um, because election does not stop at election night. I mean, voter participation needs to even extend beyond that, debrief the next day, keep that momentum going and flowing. So that's just one of my experiences and one of the ways that we encouraged the night before, the day before elections turn out. Um, but there are other ways as well. So I wanna hear from David, um, David Bouldery from Sinclair um, College. I'm gonna mute my mic so, and, um, so that David can um, talk about his experiences and, and the ways that they are doing it either right now or in the past. And then um, after David, we'll hear from um, 
what's going on in Brooklyn. All right, take it away, David. Thank you so much, Beardus. Uh, I see many of your names. It looks like Elise, Ursula, Tavita, Carrie, Jesse, um, Helen, we've met now. So, um, and it looks like a phone number. So who's that phone number, Verdis? Do you know? For me, actually. Oh, oh, okay. So then that makes sense to me. So you're watching, but uh, you're calling, you got the phone in. All right. Yeah. So Helen, right? Yeah. Yeah, great. So anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this discussion. I think the reason that uh, Sinclair was sort of spotlighted in some ways is because of some research that was done through Tufts University. Um, and maybe you had Nancy Thomas on your campus too. Uh, Nancy Thomas works with Tufts and she worked on a project called the Campus Climate for Political Learning and Engagement in democracy. Um, and uh, Verdes, is that something that other campuses have engaged with? I mean, Nancy is pretty well known. Um, uh, most, most campuses, um, I mean, there was a few that were selected for that project, and it was really specific to some of the battleground um, states. Right. Um, and also campuses like the Ohio State but also to pair that with Sinclair Community College, that type of thing. Okay. But most people um, have uh, deal with InSolve. They have InSolve data and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that InSolve data, um, and of course, Nancy was able to take a look at a number of pieces of data related to our student population. And really, I think then looking at voter uh, turnout, realized that for whatever reason, our students happen to be... Um, more likely to participate as voters than the average college student on a campus. Uh, and so she came to our campus to interview people. She did a number of focus groups and, and we were kind of scrambling to try to make sure that we could support her and meet her needs. But I think at the end of the day, we learned that there's a number of reasons why our students were more likely to be engaged. And that's what I hope to share a little bit about and uh, encourage people to figure out what part of that maybe you could do on your campus, what part of that maybe is unique to our campus, but you could learn from and in some way engage. Uh, she did create a conceptual framework that included a number of different areas. Um, so, you know, what is the political environment? What are the kinds of cultural elements of a campus to be more likely to be engaged? What about the structural kinds of uh, systems or the human kinds of inputs that might influence whether or not students become first registered to vote and then secondarily be active in the voting opportunities? And Verdes, you mentioned that um, it was your first vote, right? Uh, and that was when Barack Obama was running for the first time. Uh, of course, that in itself, right, the political environment made some of our campuses more likely to be engaged because certainly there was this choice that people had never had before. Uh, and so especially for my campus being in the city of Dayton, the fourth largest city in the state of Ohio, uh, and having about, I don't know, 18 to 20 percent African Americans uh, on campus and in our community, uh, maybe that was one of the reasons that we saw an uptick in terms of voter registration, but that wasn't the only thing. Uh, and there's a number of things that our campus has done to engage students to become civically engaged, to become registered to vote and then to vote. For instance, um, we are a swing state. And uh, anybody else that's been in a swing state, you know, at dinner time, you get about six phone calls because you, <laughs> that's what happens. And we play a game in our house where we guess who is it going to be this time. And, you know, maybe we say, oh, Bill Clinton, because, you know, Bill was going to encourage us to vote for Hillary. Or maybe somebody would say, oh, no, it's going to be, you know, George W. Bush. Or maybe it's, I don't know. H.W. Bush, and we would play these games where we would kind of guess who's calling today uh, because there are lots of calls that are being made. So there's certainly outside political kinds of influences that might influence us differently than if I were in North Dakota, perhaps, right, which doesn't have as many electoral college votes and probably is not as likely to be a swing state to begin with. Um, we take action, though, on campus to engage students to become voters. One reason is because we are a levy-supported community college. 
Uh, so like Cuyahoga, like Lorraine Community College, I think there might be one more in Ohio, we gain public support through uh, a tax levy that the community votes on and either supports for, eh, it might be five or a 10 year levy. Uh, and so a portion of their real estate tax will go in support of the community college. That ensures that our tuition remains accessible, affordable. Uh, so currently I think our tuition is around $150 a credit hour to the student in county. And really though, the cost is more than that, but the county residents, the homeowners, property owners, are paying additional amounts in their real estate taxes to help support us. So we have reason to want our students to vote in support of you know, that levy and certainly to be voters, period. So there's some sort of, I guess you could call that political kinds of elements that are important. Um, I think culturally though, on our campus, there is this idea that the faculty are very engaged and they encourage their students to be very engaged. Uh, so faculty are talking about, are you a, a registered voter? Aren't you a registered voter? Do you know how to do it? And oh, did you know that out of the hallway here, there's a table where you can become a registered voter? And we would have these tables sort of scattered around campus so that if you're walking, you would encounter two or three of them just on your way to the parking structure. And of course, uh, my campus, like probably many of yours, is lots of commuters and lots of students that are, you know, running from their car to the classroom and then running back to the car. So um, we were strategic in that sense of making it easy to be registered to vote. We also physically are right across the street from the Board of Elections. So that gives us the advantage of being able to literally walk students across the street. And we would do that on the election, once the election season opened, and we have almost a month in Ohio where you can early vote. Uh, so what we would do is we would say, all right, at 11.45 a.m. or at noon, whatever, we're going to you know, parade across the street and we're all going to go cast our ballot. And so it started maybe with uh, the volleyball team and they said, hey, we want to do this. So let's do we're going to pick Wednesday. And then the next week, maybe it was the softball team or it was, you know, whatever other group that might be interested. Uh, you could take if you wanted to take your class. A sociology class or whatever and said hey if you're interested in your Montgomery County resident we can walk across the street tomorrow at whatever time uh, not forcing students to vote certainly not telling them how to vote but giving them the opportunity to realize that this is doable that's one of the other things and, and I'm guessing your campuses like mine many times students are voting for the first time and they're not familiar with what to expect when they go to the poll and so we have invited the Board of Elections to bring a machine to campus and they demonstrate with the little plastic card that you pop into the device um, how this works. And in fact, one time we had like a little mock election. So I forget if we were voting on Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck for president or something silly. Uh, and I suppose it could have been, I don't know, Beyonce or Jay-Z, right? I mean, you could choose anybody that you want. But the idea that they would then sort of practice and to, to play with the, uh, the machine such that it became familiar to them and they would understand what was there and what to expect and how that might work. Does anybody else have that ability? Have you tried that? Um, and I'm looking for you know, any feedback or other ideas. No, I love that idea. I wrote it down and I don't, you know, I'll try and get, see if I can whip something up before election day. I think that would be really helpful to kind of break away from any intimidation that students may have um, in terms of walking in and then knowing what to do. They might be embarrassed to walk in and, and ask for help. Um, and I was embarrassed that my this past election, I they said choose one and I chose two or they said choose two and I chose whatever. Right. So I actually had to do it over again. And then it wasn't my first time voting. But, you know, mistakes happen. You sure. don't pay attention. You, you're on autopilot. So I think it's important for students to know that they, if it's something very unfamiliar, they can ask questions, um, not who to vote for, but how, how to fill out the ballot. And this would be great if they can practice. Yeah. And I think it was, um, I think it was good, um, David, when you were saying about how um, you know, uh, especially if you can, if you do have early, early voting in your state and not all states have it, um, New York doesn't, but, um, and other states don't, um, Ohio, I guess does, but, um, 
but uh but one thing to do is i mean if 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 i mean it depends on uh the county too um mm -hmm. you can't just go to any one it's got to be one in your neighborhood or one on your street or you know that type of thing right. but um but uh but one one thing that i that i was toying with in one idea was similar to like walk um walk to vote and utilizing and training um students to um to get their their neighbors the people their their households and things like that have a little party on their street and then you know everyone election day you know walk together to the polls which is sometimes in walking distance sometimes not but to uh, for a way to get students there but ha i mean get people in your neighborhood but getting having community college students leading that way and it right. seems like that's what you guys were doing um, on your campus yeah. i mean it's lucky that it's just literally across the street and it's not even a full city block away um, i mean historically and you know there's some really powerful stories of how far people had to walk to vote mm -hmm. and the, the sacrifices they would make um, now i understand and i haven't seen all the details on this but lyft and uber apparently are also going to be providing rides and as I understand it, free in certain areas and maybe discounted in others. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's that is my understanding, and I believe that that's that um, that that is exactly um, you know what they're offering. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see um, how that pans out. Sure. But do you have anything more to add before we go to what's going on in Brooklyn? So the other thing that I would share is that. Our campus has also had long-standing close ties with the local League of Women Voter organization. Mm. Uh, and so I would just remind everybody that the League of Women Voters exists because it was just over a hundred years ago that they women did not have the right to vote. And so the League worked to gain that right. And it took them, I think, almost 20 years. So we will be celebrating in 2020 the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote and i would encourage all of our campuses to think about what are we going to do to celebrate that opportunity how could we participate maybe with our local league or in what way might we want to draw attention to that anniversary uh, you know every vote matters every vote counts i think it's more obvious when individuals remember that in some cases they didn't have the right to vote and veritas when you acknowledge that you got emotional well that's because Oftentimes you had no one for which to vote, a person that didn't represent your kinds of concerns. And so, and we, of course, we will quickly recognize the words of Martin Luther King, right? That you either can't vote or you have no one for which to vote, right? Uh, so those things become important. And I think the more that we can tie that to what we do on the campus, it's important. And there are ways that you can tie it to the classroom activity so that it's not uh, sort of separate from class, but it's part of what we do, certainly in a history class, uh, certainly in a sociology class, certainly in my public speaking class. These are things, conversations that we can have and we shouldn't uh, shy away from. Right. And, um, and just to let you know that it, it, it is um, somewhat illegal to, um, to coax or to, to, to make it a condition um, to get people to vote. In other words, you can't say, okay, you fell my class or, or, you, know, right. or you have a voted, I voted today sticker. Or you're like, in order to get this this slice of pizza, you have to vote. <laughs> no, you no. can't do that. But you know, you can encourage, but it cannot be a conditional thing. So, yeah. um, so you cannot say, okay, you either vote or you don't get extra credit. There's got to be other ways because not everyone is eligible to vote. So, that's exactly yeah. right. But, right. but I think in my public speaking class, for instance, it would be per perfectly acceptable for students to give a persuasive speech on why vote matters. Yes. Or even to advocate for a particular issue. Uh, we do another speech type called the invitational speech where we invite people to discuss a topic. And so to discuss in our state right now, it'll be issue one, the question of uh, is some what I consider to be minor marijuana charges that end up with uh, prison time. Uh, you know, is that reasonable and, and ought we rethink that? Mm -hmm. uh, so in our state, right, we have passed medical and I don't know, I don't think we have passed any recreational, but other states have. And yet we have these laws on the books that would, you know, penalize a person for possession, for instance, of minor amounts of marijuana. And, you know, issue one is going to be our chance to rethink that. Okay. And that's great to, to bring that into the classroom and use it as an assignment. Yep. But what's going on in Brooklyn, Helen? 
Well, I'm happy to share. Um, so for those of you who may not know me, I am Helen Margaret Nasser. I'm the director of our Student Union and Intercultural Center here at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York. So as Virtus mentioned, Kingsborough is a very diverse um, community college, as is Brooklyn um, on the whole. So we have over um, 140 different countries represented, over 70 different languages spoken. Um, but one thing that's really absent from our campus is political dialogue, which has been very, very interesting. We don't have um, traditional Republican or um, Democrat clubs. We don't have um, a debate club. So these are things that haven't been part of the student conversation. Um, faculty have lately um, been trying to make political involvement more um, personal and uh, direct to our students and trying to make it more tangible for them. So what I've been doing um, in our student union and intercultural center in collaboration with a lot of faculty is trying to help students understand how their vote is needed and what happens when their vote is absent. So really letting them understand that they have a role to play in the political process. Um, you know, we've been trying to do a lot of myth busting. Uh, my vote doesn't matter, my vote doesn't count, oh, it's a blue state anyway. Um, and one of the ways that, and that's, it was interesting to hear you talk about Ohio and how it's a swing state, because that's, you know, a whole different set. You know, students may already be accustomed to being political whereas here it's kind of been taken for granted. Um, so that's one thing that has been an issue. So um, what we've tried to do is to help students understand the political process is break it down for them. So, you know, Washington um, may be far away, literally and, and, and figuratively for students. Um, so we try and let them figure it out at local levels. So how their political voice can be much more um, impactful, um, participating in community boards, knowing who their local representatives are, so letting them see that there are immediate effects to their political participation. Um, because it's true, sometimes when we try and affect change in Washington, it takes longer, the process is much more complicated, um, there are a lot more players and it could get discouraging. So we want students to kind of know that in their communities, if there's a problem, you know, they have agency, they have power, um, citizens and non-citizens alike, whether you're registered or not registered to vote, you know, you have power to kind of help affect change in your own communities. So that's how we want them to feel more connected to politics. So it's not necessarily an issue thing, so that way we're taking away hot topics and things that might be contested for students to say, oh, I'm not political, which we're trying to work on too, but letting them see that being political, quote unquote, is being a citizen in terms of a community member, um, someone who just wants to make their lives easier, the lives of those around them easier. Um, so trying to just break it down in that way. Some of the initiatives that we've done, um, and we were able to do this through the funding generously provided by Virtus, thank you. Um, and we also have um, a small faculty innovation award that is funded by our president's office. Uh, so we had our traditional oh. constitution day and in the past, it has been a very passive day. We are in a highly trafficked area. Pocket com uh, constitutions are handed out, and that's essentially the end of the exchange, the end of the engagement. So this year, I got involved and got a little more active. And we printed out the preamble in large print so that everyone could see it. And we took um, those large post-its so that students could write. And we asked them to prompt. We asked them to write down who are we the people, and we wanted students to unpack and say, what is and who are the people? Who are you? I'm a student, I'm a woman, I'm an Arab American, I'm a mother, um, all of these different things. I'm a Muslim, I'm a voter, I'm a non-voter, I'm a citizen, I'm not a citizen, I'm black. So that way we can see the diversity in our union. Um, and we can see how that has evolved and how it doesn't always reflect all of these different identities and that's complicated um, and then the next question that we asked is what would make our union more perfect so we really wanted them to not hold back and tell us what what would you like to see we're not perfect it's this, uh, an aspirational uh, thing that we're always working towards so what could we do how could we get there 
Um, and it was the first time for a lot of students to interact with the Constitution in that way, to really unpack the preamble and think about how it affects them. And it was really telling when I was speaking to students who some of them, you know, I had to coerce into talking to me, of course, as they were passing the hallway. But I was speaking to some of our African American and black students and I was saying, listen, when this was written, you and I were not part of this at all. What does that tell you? What are we doing about it? Do we want to stay a part of it? Now that we are, how are we making sure that we're heard? So that was really powerful for our students to remember that this was a hard fought right and that we should keep earning it um, and keep working for it and, and using it. Another thing that helps in terms of dialogue is that since we have such a diverse um, campus, students come from all different countries. Um, so as I mentioned, um, well, I'm Egyptian American, so my parents came from Egypt, I'm first generation here, um, and that's a democracy where uh, politicians are elected 99% every single time. So what did that mean? You know, so I told, you know, students, I asked them, where, where is your country of origin? What does government look like? Is it a democracy? Is it not a democracy? So that helps them understand that this is um, a privilege that is not afforded in a lot of other countries. So that's another um, point of access where students can make connections and say, okay, yeah, this is important. I didn't have this back home. Um, you know, for me personally, my dad always said, you never forfeit the right to vote. So he came and he was honored to have that right because he didn't have it in the same capacity coming from Egypt. So that brings a different uh, relevance. So, you know, things like voting. Okay, it's a right, we have it. But how can we cherish it and use it so that we can make it uh, effective? So the Constitution Day was effective. And then we had our voter uh, registration day. And again, I've been at Kingsborough for 10 years and I've never seen such a robust voter um, registration day. Uh, so we really were out there getting students to fill out the ballots, uh, filling out the registration forms. Some students were eager. They said, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, I have to do this. Okay, here I am. Um, some students, we had to encourage them a little bit more to understand why it was important. And then now the follow-up is getting them out uh, to vote. Uh, just yesterday, we had one of our um, New York State Senators come to speak to our students. So we had about 50 students join us, and uh, we wanted to hear about the power of political participation. We wanted them to know about um, the life of, of a New York State Senator. What is their day-to-day? -day? What do they do for their constituents? Who are their constituents? Um, so that was really impactful for our students to see who politicians are, um, what was their rise to politics, because again, I think students associate politicians as um, people with a certain pedigree, a, a certain background, uh, and that, that excludes them automatically, again, from being civically active. So that's another message that we want students to understand is that there are no prerequisites to be an active uh, citizen. You have to just, you know, speak up, participate, and, 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 and be present. So that's something we're trying to um, instill in our students. So we're working across campus in the classrooms uh, to make sure that this message is more heard. And then it also helps permeate, while we might not be a political campus, there are a lot of issues that are affecting our students um, that can help influence their uh, interest in voting. You know, so we have uh, obviously a large population of immigrants. We have um, undocumented and DACA students uh, we have many students of color. So in those identities, there are issues that uh, are pressing for those populations to vote and to make sure that they're heard. So we're trying to make sure that we can, whether, you know, so again, when a student says I'm not political, we help them understand how they are <laughs> just by being who they are. And it's kind of hard not to be uh, political and what happens when they're absent from the system. So we're hopeful. Um, this is uh, the beginning of a journey for us here at Kingsborough, and it's not the end, but we're paralleling that with a lot of collaborations across campus, across the disciplines, to make sure that it's something that won't just go away uh, on November 6th. I had an office call and say, oh, well, the deadline to register has passed. What do I do with the forms? They said, well, they can still fill them out, and they'll be ready for next time. So it's an ongoing campaign to register to vote. Uh, not just leading up to a big election, right. not just right before the deadline, but this is a culture that um, students are getting accustomed to. Um, some students proudly said, oh yeah, I remember filling that out when I became a citizen. 
So, you know, they were ready and they said, okay, great. Don't forget November 6th. This is your chance, your first election. Let's go. So um, those constant reminders to make sure that students know. Yeah, thank you. And um, I just wanted to um, also say that, um, you know, uh, we were going to have um, uh, Community College of Allegheny County on the phone, um, on the line. Um, but if you know uh, Mary Frances Archie, she recently retired. Mm -hmm. So she was going to be on the call. Um, they have used um, TurboVolt for a long time. And, and so that's, that's one of their ways of encouraging voter turnout. So she was going to talk about how they use TurboVolt that mm -hmm. basically uh, sends uh, students text messages um, reminding them when the primaries are, reminding them when, um, when the registration is up or uh, when the deadlines are, you know, reminding them um, through text messaging and things of that nature or through email um, and how that has been effective. In other words, they put it as um, part of their um, orientation. Mm -hmm. So when students register for, uh, for classes, they don't register to vote, but then they can opt in to turbo vote. Mm -hmm. um, and things and utilizing that. Um, so, and that has been proven um, effective on their campuses as well. And um, that's a uh, community college in Pittsburgh. Um, one of the things I also want to mention because you're mentioning about um, you have a big immigrant population. And so that can be very problematic when you're saying go vote, go vote. And they were just like, well, I'm not a citizen yet, I can't vote. So how, um, so one, one way that I did to make sure that students who were either still on parole, <laughs> you know, we have um, a lot of our, um, some of our population are still on the books, so to speak, and cannot um, vote. Um, and some of our students are um, un ineligible to vote for various reasons. Um, how do we engage them? And one of the ways that I engage them is um, not through, um, you know, encouraging to vote, but encourage them in the process of learning who's on the ballot and getting students out there saying, look, I can't vote, but can you vote for me? Um, you know, that, that type of thing. And, you know, so they set up Facebook pages and they're like, I can't vote, but I can do something. Um, so to really encourage them and especially when, when, when faculty are given um, like extra credit for I voted today sticker, what about the, be mindful of those students that cannot vote, say, you know, to have them reflect on that, 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 you know, about voting or that they cannot vote and have them reflect on that and have that be uh, an assignment to give extra credit for. Um, things like that to really, um, to really make sure that we're being inclusive and on that as well. Now, we do have a couple of people on, on the phone and I'm not sure if they would like to um, chat. Um, and if you do, uh, by all means, I'll mute your mic and um, ask a question. Um, but, um, and, I mean, or just uh, say something in the chat box. And, um, but until we have that, you know, you have two completely different community colleges on the phone right now. You got Sinclair, and I've never been there, um, but it's on Ohio, but I've been to um, Kingsboro. And when I'm going to come to Sinclair, we'll talk about that offline, David. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but at the same time, it seems like we're still in a learning process. You know, it seems like every generation or every year we have to kind of tweak. It's not one size fits all. And that's the, that's the, um, that's the hard part about this. It's not like, you know, we're in a four year school and most of our students don't even live in the community. And we just have to worry about absentee ballots. But a lot of our students live, come from the community, are in the community more than they are on that campus, yep. but still are not registered, still do not vote. And, and what goes on in that county that they're going to be voting for affects them as students and still have a very low turnout. Right. So, um, so, I mean, I'm glad that you're speaking to that. Um, but yeah, it's very challenging sometimes. It, it is interesting. And, you know, I think each of us, we are unique, and so we have to figure out what can we do in our community. I like that Helen has uh, approached the local elected officials or people running for office. Um, and that's awesome because then you really begin to recognize that all politics is local, that, you know, we talk about that, but do students understand what that really means? So um, I think that's important. You reminded me too about uh, the fact that because we are a swing state and we're a large downtown campus, 
with good facilities, there are times when speakers want to speak to the public and they can come to our campus as a way to do that. So we had um, Chelsea Clinton in, in our library and she stood sort of halfway down the stairs into the library. So she was elevated a little bit. Uh, everybody could see her and, and students just gathered around to listen to her story as she was supporting her mom in, in that uh, uh, most recent election. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think about uh, other times when we've done things on campus to try to draw attention to the opportunity. And of course, all of those things are gonna kind of come up, and they bubble up, they can't plan sometimes for some of these things. You find that somebody's coming to the community and so you try to find a way to have the students interact or engage with those individuals, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and, um, and just to piggyback on what you were just saying, um, in the 2016 elections, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the, the the political science groups clubs on campus they decided that hey we're going to invite some presidential candidates to come on campus they're never going to come so they invited um, Hillary Clinton Bernie Sanders uh, Donald Trump Ted Cruz they invited all of them to come on campus and guess what Hillary Clinton accepted the invitation. <sighs> Yeah. So she came on campus and right away, as soon as the news went out, the president, and that's the thing, so the presidents of, of the campuses, they got to be kind of careful because, again, um, it's that local election and they got to make sure that they are nonpartisan because sometimes the, right. the, the local budgets are, you know, partisan. <laughs> they are. And so they have to make sure that, you know, so she sent out an email saying, okay, we we, we invited all candidates and she accepted. And then after she accepted, Bernie Sanders accepted. And then he came right after. And then Ted yeah. Cruz was just like, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm coming too. And he came to the campus and Donald Trump came to the city, but he was like, I'm not sharing the same stage <laughs> as Hillary and Bernie. So he, um, so he was about a few miles from the campus. But these are our students that, that, got, that made that happen. Um, and some of our students got a chance to introduce them. Um, like one of my students, he was in my class at that time, he introduced Hillary Clinton, but, but you know, when Bernie Sanders came, he was behind Bernie Sanders with his son. He wasn't <laughs> behind Ted Cruz, but that was his choice. <laughs> but, you know, but that, but again, that was a community college. So there, I mean, we do have power, um, but I, we have to let our students know. And with, with these examples and even more that about the power of community colleges, don't just think I'm a community college or we, we can't get these politicians to come or we can't turn out the vote. Can you imagine if 15,000 students in a county were to vote? Guess right. what? Politicians will all be all over that campus. They'll, they'll say, let's give that campus some money. Let's fund them. You know, I mean, to, to really show that, that civic power of community colleges. That's why I do what I do. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's why I do what I do. <laughs> and I think it helps to really have, help students understand why they're so needed. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the ways that we've been able to do that at Kingsboro is you know, especially when you have this and say, oh, who cares? It doesn't bother me. It doesn't make a difference. I tell them, well, don't wait for it to bother you. <laughs> I mean, just because the issues don't affect you now, don't wait for them. Don't wait till it's too late. You know, and it's a little dire, but, you know, I always think that, you know, and we give the example in terms of civic engagement. I always look um, at the Arab Spring as an example. You know, so this was something that was people power. You know, and people were scared, people were intimidated, people didn't have voice. But when they saw that the rights that were being taken away, the abuses that were being taken away, and they saw something personal there, they said, that could be me, that could be my brother, that could be my mom, that could be my sister. Then they were able to go and, and they were compelled and they were courageous and they were able to create change. So we want to make that happen sooner. We, want, we don't want it to wait till it gets to that point, but we do think it's effective for students to see the personal in their choices and that there is something that's affecting them in the decisions that they're making, in the candidates that they're choosing, in the people who are representing them, uh, that it does affect them, even though if they're looking at it from the perspective of Washington, it feels so far away. There are repercussions, there are impacts. So I think when we have students understand who they are, what matters to them, then becoming an active 
um, and the civically engaged student is the next step. Yeah, you just dropped the mic. <laughs> you could just drop the mic and walk away. <laughs> so thank you, thank you both um, for being a part of this dialogue. Um, I felt like I was just, this was like, like, like an interview or something like that. And, you know, we were just, you know, this is like a podcast or something. <laughs> uh, but it's so great to, um, to, to, to see what's going on in Ohio and, and New York. Um, you know, we had Texas on the phone and we had some other uh, people as well. Um, but again, you know, um, we got to keep this momentum going. This is the first kind of iteration, reiteration of the Engaged Election Project. We've, we've been kind of doing the Engaged Election Project since 2012. But now that we have the support of Campus Compact, we have the, the network of Campus Compact as well as the just time is just now. It's just now <laughs> to, to really, really uh, make a difference and, um, and to really educate our students for democracy. Hence, you know, the Education for Democracy initiative of Campus Compact. So with that being said, and it's, and it's um, our hours up, um, I'd like to thank uh, David Bodery from Sinclair Community College in Ohio, um, and Helen Margaret Nasser from CUNY Kingsborough, Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and from live from Boston, Massachusetts, from the from, from the Campus Compact Intergalactic Headquarters. Um, I uh, again uh, for those on the call, thank you for joining us. And look up for the webpage where we have more resources, and we're going to be building on top of this as part of our Education for Democracy initiative of Campus Compact. So again. Thank you for joining us and um, let's keep that momentum going. Absolutely, thank you, Bernice. Thank you, David. All right, take care. Thank you very Bye. much, take care. Bye. All right.